If you have a Bible, open to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. I want to continue my series, Walking in the Steps of Christ. I don't know anybody, I don't know anybody who's a Christian who doesn't want to be like the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, as a young Christian, most of the time what we want is just to have power like Jesus Christ, right? Am I right? As a young Christian, I remember fascinated with the Gospels. That Jesus could heal people and walk on water and feed 5,000 and speak and the tree could be withered. Well, there's only one Jesus. And I don't think you're going to have that power. All right. I tried when I was young as an immature young Christian. And my enthusiasm, one time I tried to walk on a lake and I sunk right in. So don't do it. Amen. But what does it mean to be like Jesus? What does it mean to, to be like Christ? I think one thing it means is to live a life that honors and glorifies his father, our father. Amen. And I said, if you're going to walk like Christ walked, one of the things you will be most likely impressed with, a couple weeks ago I said, is that he prayed. One of the least practiced disciplines of the faith, prayer. Years ago, a friend of mine, Jay Oliva, God bless him, an evangelist in New York City who taught me how to share the gospel. I was talking about him this morning in our little prayer time this morning. And that man told me, Jesus, if you don't set aside time to pray, you will not see the power of God released in your life. He used to tell me, because I was so fascinated that whenever he went out, to, and now there's a gift of evangelism, we know that. And he had it. He's, he, he made no qualms of it. He had to get. But whenever we went out to share the gospel, he would spend an hour before praying and an hour after praying. And he used to say to me, if you don't pray, it's as if you're not asking God to get involved in his work. And if you look at the gospels, you're going to see that Jesus prayed. And then I said last week, you're going to notice that the Lord and Savior was obedient. Wow. That's a hard word. Obedience. Nobody wants to be told to be obedient. Later today, I'm going to talk about submission. Wow, what a difficult word today in this culture. I know one of my patients, she told me this week that she, she still struggles with her her little problem of substance use disorder. But she says for no reason. She's cut back all the way. She's cut back tremendously. And she says to me, I don't even know why I use because the amount that I'm using does nothing for me. And I halfway believe her. And she says, you know why? I said, well, you tell me. It's your life. I don't know what's going on in your head. You tell me. Why do you continue to do the things you know are not beneficial for you? She says, I think because everybody keeps telling me I can't do it. So therefore, I want to do it. I said, so you like being disobedient? <laughs> and she says, I think there's a part of me that does. And you'll be lying if you say that there's not a little part of you also that likes to be disobedient. Right? But if we're going to walk in the steps of Christ, you're going to see he prayed. You're going to see he was obedient. And today, you're going to see he was in the word of God. He was in the word of God. This is brother I heard about, Puerto Rican boxer Hector Colon. He tells a story that when he was a young man living in, uh, I believe it was Michigan, Hector Colon says that there was other kids that didn't look like him. You know what I mean by that, right? Can I give you a side note? Sometimes I get distracted. I think that's my ADHD. But um, how come, I'm sorry, this thing got nothing to do with my message. How come you never see black people or, la or Latino people get bit by sharks? There's always white people. 
You ever notice that? I'm just saying, it's just, I just realized that. It seems like it's always white people get bit by sharks. Ain't that something? Anyway, I'm sorry. I went swimming yesterday, and, you know, we were over there enjoying ourselves. But I get distracted sometimes. I apologize. But <laughs> somebody help me answer that question, please. But this brother grew up in, in, in uh, Wisconsin, up there in Michigan, he says, in the upper regions over there. And this is what he said, that he wasn't like everybody else. And so they would pick on him. They would call him names because he was Puerto Rican. And he was dark-skinned. And one day somebody popped him with his nose and he went home and his father told him, listen, you're going to learn how to box. So he took him to this guy they call Shorty, Acosto, nicknamed Shorty, and he trained. And the, Shorty said, your son is a natural. He was a little guy, elementary school. He said, let me train him. Well, I don't know. The story goes, he ended up becoming a competitive boxer. He became a gold glove boxer an Olympic boxer, because this guy recognized in him that he had talent. But he said this, Hector said this, I grew up in church, and I grew up in the word of God. The more I got involved in boxing, the more happy I felt, the more better I felt, the less I started to go to church, and the less I started to read the word of God. It just happened that his trainer, Shorty, was a Christian. And then he told his mother, let your son stay with me so I could train him. And not only did he train him how to box, he trained him how to study the word of God. He says, once or twice in my life, I found myself still pulling away, and he ended up in the Olympics. He said, I got knocked out. When I got knocked out in the Olympics, it, it discouraged me, and I wasn't sure. He goes, but I had this thing in my heart because even though I, I knew God and I said I love God, he goes, I knew I wasn't really as close to God as I should be. I love boxing more than I love God. And that was the truth. He goes, man, I, I, I recommitted my life to the Lord. And I said, Lord, I'm a box. I'm going to give it one more shot. But tell me what it is you would have me to do. And this is his story. He went back. And the same guy that he fought before, he fought again, but this time he knocked him out in something like 30 seconds. And he knew it was because for him, he had to surrender and commit his life to the Lord. But he said, I still had this thing in me that felt like maybe I shouldn't box. And the more he was in the word, the closer he felt to God. Come on, now listen to me. Amen. The more he sensed that God was speaking to him. Eventually, he gave up boxing. And he went into the ministry. Man, we hear stories like that and we think, that's awesome, that's beautiful. Why can't that happen to me? The truth is, it can if you walk the way Jesus walked. If you live the way Christ lived, he prayed. He was obedient. And he was in the word of God. And those are the same things that should be in our lives, no? No? Pastor, God doesn't speak to me anymore. Now, he's speaking. You're probably just not listening. It's been a long time since God told me to do something. No, he's telling you. <laughs> you're just not listening. And then my question to you is, are you in the word of God? If you want God to speak to you, how can he speak to you if you're not in the word of God. How, how can he speak to you? I know he uses circumstances and sometimes God uses other people and sometimes God uses trials and tribulations and sometimes through prayer God will speak to you but the most direct way God speaks to you is through that word. Are you with me? Luke chapter 2. Let's look at the life of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, let me share this with you before we jump to that. Verse 41. I'm going to say this to you. Dusty Bibles usually means dirty lives. A dusty Bible usually means a dirty life. In fact, either you're in the Word and the Word is in you, or you're in the world and the world is in you. But if your Bible 
seems to, don't feel guilty, please don't feel guilty, amen, don't feel guilty, that's not what I'm trying to do this morning, I want to challenge you, but you can't be one of those people that's hearing the voice of God, is this, when you leave church, you take your Bible and throw it in the back seat of the car, and you don't pick it up again till Sunday again, I'm sorry, but that's, that's a true statement, amen, if your Bible is dusty, be careful now, you might have a dirty life, but if we look at the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Jesus studied the word. Verse 41, every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to the feast according to the custom after the feast was over. While his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among the relatives and friends. We know the story, right? When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. And after three days, they found him. Now, here's the part I want to stop and let's think about real quick. Most of the time when we read this story, we have this uh, a little bit of uh, a rightfully so sanctified imagination. And we, we believe that the little Jesus was, was telling everybody else. But verse 46 says, after three days, they found him in the temple courts. What was he doing? What was he doing? Sitting among the teachers, listening to them, and asking them questions. Jesus studied the Bible. After three days, we usually think he's teaching them, and he, he's the smart one, and he's prophesying to them, but, but no, no. Did he have to study? Well, on the human side of things, and he's fully God and fully man, all right? Yes. But did he really have to study as the divine second person of the Trinity? No. But he did. What are the results? What does the Bible say are the results? Well... If you look at Luke 2, 40, I believe it's 40, it says, And the child grew and became strong, and he was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Luke 2, 40. You look at Luke 2, 52, And Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and men. How? Because Jesus studied the word of God. If we're going to walk the way Jesus walked, which kind of means live the way Christ lived. Listen, the more words you have, I, I know this is right, the more faith you'll have. The more words you have, the more roots you will develop, spiritual roots. Listen now. The more spiritual roots you develop, come on now, the higher your worship will go. But if you're not in the word, you can't develop faith. If you're not in the word, you won't develop roots. If you're not in the word, your worship might not be what it's supposed to be. In fact, most of the Psalms, they're songs. You want to learn how to pray? You want to learn how to worship? Read the Psalms. And they'll teach you how to pray. And they'll teach you how to worship. Jesus did it. See, here's another, here's another discipline of the faith. Reading the word. Jesus studied the word. How did he grow in favor with God and man? How? Because the Bible says his wisdom grew. His knowledge grew. Because he was in the word. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. Verse 52 of Luke, and Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and favor with God and men. You want to grow in your walk with God? You want to walk in the steps of Christ? You have to be in the word. You have to be in prayer. Next week, I'm going to talk about being led by the spirit. Well, this is how I see it. If you're in the word, it strengthens your prayer. If you're in the word, you learn what it means to be obedient to the Lord. And as you're in the word and your prayer is strengthened and you learn what it means to be obedient, 
You'll walk more in step now with the Holy Spirit. That's how I see it. Are you with me? It says he grew. When I deal with people, especially who are struggling, we do this thing called, uh, it's, and I've shared this before, you're physical. Are you physical? Raise your hand. Do you got to eat? Raise your hand if you have to eat. Yeah, amen. And we had some pizza yesterday from Mike's, and that was pretty good pizza, I'm going to say. Wasn't it? Amen. Amen. So we're not just, so we're, we're physical, right? We're also, I'm going to say, psychological. We have a mind to think. We have emotions, right? We're also social beings. It was fun yesterday being out there. It's how it was, it was to be out there and hand out bags and to be together as a community. You will die by yourself. I heard a pastor went to visit this young man who decided he wasn't going to go to church anymore. He said, I didn't need church. He goes, I just need me and God, and that's it. So this happened way back in the olden times where they had fireplaces with coal. The story goes, while the young man was talking to the pastor about why he didn't need church no more, the pastor took a prong, picked up a piece of coal, and set it off to the side. And he just let the young man talk. The young man talked about how he was gifted. He, need, he knew the word of God. Jesus loved him, and he did not need to go to church. And as he kept talking, that little piece of coal began to die out. And then it smoked itself off. And all the pastor said to him is, stop going to church. You'll be that piece of coal by yourself. We're social beings. We have to be together. God created. He says, do not forsake the assembling together. Yes, I know. The church doesn't save you. First of all, the church is not the building anyway. The church is us. Amen? We know that ecclesia, the call out ones. I know coming to church doesn't make you a Christian. Like a pastor friend of mine told me when I was young, going to church building doesn't make you Christian, just like he said, uh, how, what is it? That's right. <laughs> Amen. My point is this. You, we, God has told us to assemble together. By your, so we're physical beings. And a lot of times, that's all we, sometimes, some people, all they want to focus on. Jesus grew physically. He did. Amen. The Bible says he learned how to walk, work. He, he had a trade, right? We're psychological beings. Sometimes we get depressed. Sometimes we get discouraged. Sometimes we deal with different things like that, Can I, right? That's just how it is. But we're also social beings. You have to be together. You have to assemble. assemble you can't be by yourself. You're going to die spiritually by yourself. And then the last part, which we feel tops all of it, we're spiritual beings. But the Bible said Jesus grew. How? Part of the reason why is because he was in the word of God. Jesus was in the word of God. Are you with me? If you're going to grow, you got to be in the word of God. You won't grow if you're not in the word of God. Jesus studied the scriptures. The Apostle Paul says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, working who does not need to be ashamed, and who rightfully handles the word of truth. God tells us to study the word. Amen? We've had languages, they say, forever. The Chinese, the Egyptians. There's always been languages. But even though languages have been around forever, less than 10% of the people of the world could read. What changed that? What shifted that? One of the things that shifted that was a man named Martin Luther, who was an Augustinian monk. And he did go up against the Catholic Church. One of the things that changed that was a man named Martin Luther, who was one of the guys who started what's called the Protestant Reformation. Just listen real quick. I'm going to help you out this morning. Amen. And he believed that every person should learn how to read so that every person can study the Bible and interpret it for themselves. That man pushed that. And because of that, now we have a high literacy. Before, mostly people couldn't read. But because of that man and his view that this was God's sacred book and that this book was how God spoke to you, he began to tell the parents, 
teach your kids how to read so that they can study the word of God, so that they can hear the verse, voice of God in their lives. Don't feel bad. How many Bibles do you have? I like buying Bibles. I'll get maybe two Bibles, Bibles every year. I just got the Legacy Bible. I got a counseling Bible for Christian for Christmas, and my wife just finished telling me, man, how many Bibles do you need? The truth is, I just, I just like collecting different types of Bibles. Can I get an amen? But I read them. The, most of us have a, more than one Bible, and the sad thing is, few of us study it. But yet part of our, how are we going to say, history of people today, that man Martin Luther with the Protestant Reformation pushed through Europe and pushed through the rest of the world that we should read and we should read to study the word of God so we can hear God's voice in our lives. My father-in-law, God rest his soul, he never went to school that I know of, but he learned how to read. And he learned how to read because he had a pastor to tell him about reading the word of God. And the one thing my father-in-law would talk to you about was the word of God. That he could read. Come on now, you better listen to me this morning. It's important to study the word of God. If we're going to walk in the steps of Christ, you're going to see that that man, Jesus, son of God, fully God, fully man, he was in the word of God. He studied the word of God. Are you with me? Something else we're going to see, and this is probably even more important than studying it, he trusted it. <laughs> Uh-oh. Nothing wrong having questions. In fact, one of the things that I learned when I went off to Bible college was something called apologetics, and it comes from the, the verse in Peter where Peter says, always be ready to give an answer for the hope that is in you. Some people have questions. Nothing wrong with wrestling through the word of God and, and learning what God has to say about specific areas of your life. Nothing wrong. But you can take my word for it. You can come to this book and trust it. Jesus studied it and he trusted. You never see Jesus question whether the word of God was true. And Jesus quotes the word of God from the very beginning. What do I mean? Jesus was shared from the book of Genesis. You don't hear him debate. For example, I'll read it to you. Jesus says, haven't you not read? He replied that in the beginning, the creator made them male and female. And he said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. Jesus doesn't question whether or not that's a true or false statement. He just goes on it as truth. So Jesus studied the word of God, and he trusts the word of God. Nothing wrong with having questions. Nothing wrong with working through it. Amen now. But I'm going to tell you, as you work through it and as you study it, you're going to come out the end of it believing like Jesus that this is God's book from beginning to the end. Jesus says, but about the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what God said to you? I am the God of Abraham. I, Jesus doesn't question whether or not God showed up to those ancient prophets and said to them he was the God of Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob. He doesn't question it. He trusted it. Jesus said that God even spoke through David in one of the Psalms. This is what Jesus says, Matthew 22. He said to them, how is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, calls him Lord? For he says... So Jesus doesn't question the faithfulness, and I've been around long enough, and I, I, I don't want to say take my word for it, but we can talk a little more if you want. But every part of this book is God's word, and you can trust it. Jesus studied it. Jesus trusted it. That's why the Bible says all scripture is God-breathed, and is useful for teaching rebuke. It's God-breathed, and Jesus trusts that it was God-breathed. I love what Isaiah says, 55.11. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but would accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You can trust the word of God. Amen? Go to Matthew chapter 5. And 
And some of you got to stop watching History Channel because that confuses you. Amen. Stop watching that. You better off watching uh, Shark Week than watching the History Channel with all that. They say they want to prove like the Bible false and stuff, you know. Matthew chapter 5. See verse 3. During the Communist Revolution, Russia became the Soviet Union, or it became the Soviet Union. The government used to mock Christianity. True story. There was this one gentleman who was an actor comedian. And he had every night put on a skit. He would dress up as a priest with stains, like wine stains, on his uh, robe. And what he would do was mock Christianity. And he would mock the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor, blessed are the meek. He would mock them. That was his, part of his gimmick, his show. And the government basically hired him to do that because he wanted people to believe that the word of God was nonsense. So his whole skit went through these verses. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He would mock it. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. He would mock these things. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And he would say, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for vodka. That was his skit. He would make fun of it. And night after night, he would, he, would, he, he would have a crowd of people that would come, and he would mock what we call the Beatitudes. But Isaiah says, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Part of the way his skit worked is he had to know the Beatitudes. He had them in his mind through memorization and through rote memory. He just would repeat them all day long so he could mock the things of God. You can't play with God's word. You get that word, living word, family church, for God's word is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the vision of soul and spirit and joint and marrow. The Bible talks about God's word like a dagger. So one day, as he began to prepare for his skit, listen to me now, the spirit of God came over him. The story goes that he began to shake. The words of Christ, blessed, blessed, blessed. He said, rattled in my head over and over again. And that night he got up and he, he said the Beatitudes the way that Christ said them. And they said at the end of that skit, he fell to his face on his knees and he was crying and he asked God, Jesus Christ, for forgiveness. God's word is powerful. Listen to me now. And you can trust it to do what God says it would do. The word changes people's lives. It can set people free. Come on now. Are you listening to me? Now the story goes after that, they took him off and put him in prison. Nobody knows what happened to that man after that. But that day, his soul was saved. He started off mocking the word of God, and his life was transformed. I heard about a young man in some place in Africa. The Gideons used to come, and I tell this story, but I love it. The Gideons used to come, and they would rip off, they would give him those Gideon Bibles. And he would take the paper of the Gideon Bible to roll up uh, marijuana and smoke it. He said he had no faith. They didn't care about those things. But one day he went to jail. Earlier that day, somebody gave him a Gideon Bible, and he ripped out a piece, stuck it in his pocket, and they arrested him for possession of marijuana. When he was in jail, he said he began to just be scared. He wasn't sure what was going to happen to him. And he pulled out that piece of paper. And I don't even remember what, what it was. And it doesn't even make sense to me. But it was a psalm. And he said he just started reading that psalm over and over and over again. He felt touched. He got out of prison. He found the man that gave him the Gideon Bible. The man led him to the Lord. And now that man, I heard, has a church somewhere in Africa, and he's leading. Don't play with the word of God. God said that his word is, is, is effective. It's sharper than that. It's living and active. It does what God says. Can I get an amen? 
Jesus trusts the word of God. Jesus, he studied the word of God and he trusts the word of God. Of course, the devil don't want you reading the word. Are you listening to me? The devil don't want you reading the word. He doesn't want you to build your faith. He doesn't want you to get close to the Lord. He studied the word of God. He trusted the word of God. And maybe the hardest part right now, he submitted to the word of God. Jesus did. There's a lot of things in scripture that we don't like. But, and if somebody tells you to submit or obey, like that lady I told you about, nobody wants to be told because we say, well, I'm free to do what I want to do, and you're right. I don't have to submit to nobody and nothing. And you're kind of right. But how about if I tell you that this book is from a divine being who loves you unconditionally, wants the best for you. He has a wonderful plan for your life. He's omnipresent. He's in all places at the same time. He's omniscient. He knows all things. He doesn't change. He's faithful. Now that person tells you, submit to me. Jesus being divine, we know the Bible says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. And the word was God. He was with God. Jesus is divine. He is the word. Right? But Jesus actually said, I've come to submit to my father. Matthew 26, 24 says, the son of man will go just as it is written about him. Just as it is written about him. But woe to the man who betrays the son. of So through the word, Jesus understood his destiny. And he submitted to that destiny through the word. Through the word, he understood how to respond to the Father. But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? And Jesus is talking to a group of people and he's saying to them, I've come to do what the Father has said for me to do. And the reason I know what God the Father has told me to do is because I have the word. That tells me. We're emotional beings. I'm going to tell you something this morning. But anybody who tells you follow your heart. Run away from them. Because the Bible says. Above all else the heart is desperately what? Wicked. Who can know it? But God. So how do you know the will of God for your life? Well, (laughs) Jesus said, because I have the book. Jesus studied the word of God. Amen. He trusted the word of God. And he submitted to the word of God. We're older in here. Amen. (laughs) Amen. Right? I got some gray now a little bit. I try to hide it, but it's there. I know when you're young, you're a little more impulsive, right? And you say things like, I've had a few counseling sessions in the young, as a youth pastor, and and young couples come to me, and they're like, but we're in love. And I get it. I get it. No, I get it. Come on. Let's be nice. (laughs) Let's be nice. But you know it's not in the will of God, right? God would not, God cannot sanction anything that goes against his word. Jesus understood the will of the Father because he studied the word, amen. He trusted the word and he knew, remember Peter when he tells Jesus that night, Jesus, let's run from here. You don't have to die. Peter, I love Peter. I keep telling you, he has to be Puerto Rican. There's no way around. When you see Peter, he got that impulsiveness, you know, that thing about him that I just love. I love Peter's one of my favorite characters. Love Peter. Love him. But one night, he's the guy that says, you are the Christ. And Jesus says, and on this rock, I will build my church. And not even a couple verses later, Peter tells Jesus, let's run out of here. Because Jesus says, I have to die for the world. And then Peter's like, let's break. Let's get out of here. And that night, Jesus calls Peter Satan. Come on now. 
Because Jesus knew the will of the Father. He studied the word. He trusted the word. And through the word, he knew what the plan of God and God's plan for him, not for us, was to die for the sins of the world. Jesus replied, to be sure, Elijah does not come first and restore us all things. Why then is it written that the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected? None of us are going to have to die for the sins of the world. Jesus already did that. That's not your thing in life. But God does want us to be blessed. And I don't see no other way that you can be blessed unless you submit to what God has said in his word. There's many things in the word of God that is extremely uncomfortable. Many things. I'll tell you one thing, and nobody, uh, don't, don't be uncomfortable now that I say it. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Be challenged. I'm talking about me. How do I grow in my walk with God? Amen. I hated every time those offering plates came down the aisle. I hated it. I did. I'm going to be honest with you. First time I put a dollar, I thought I paid all the bills of the church. <laughs> I did. Because you, I was, now my parents have always been givers, always. So I had good role models. But there's a, I got to work through my own issues, right? And God is a loving, merciful God. And then I remember when I put $5, I thought, wow, they're asking for a lot. I was probably like 24 years old. First time I put 20, I was like, wow, $20. Wow. But I can tell you what, I'm a testimony to it is more blessed to give than to receive. And we talked about that yesterday. There's nothing that I ever gave God that God never matched me two, three, four times over. Nothing. There's some things in Scripture that is hard to submit to, right? Some people have the gift of giving. And I've had a few people in this church, they have the gift of giving. There's a gift of giving. There is. And there's one or two in every church, and I thank God for them. There's a few people that doesn't matter what's happening in the church, what needs to get fixed, what's going down, they're ripping off hundreds at a clip, and I'm not exaggerating. There's always one or two that'll rip off a thousand or two and say, here, do what you got to do with it. Thank God for them. But not all of us have the gift. But all of us have, have been called to give, have been called to serve have been called to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, have been called to, we're not all evangelists, but God has called all of us to do some evangelism. Even yesterday, what a blessing. It was hot. Y'all, those freeze pops were for me. I was sweating out there. Amen. But that was work. That was a blessing, no? And God, Jesus said, look, man, I had to submit. To what the Father is telling me to do. Even when it's uncomfortable, I'm going to submit. You want to walk like Jesus? Study the word. Trust the word. Submit to the word. And you'll be blessed. I heard a story about a little Indian kid. This is the story I heard. He loved to play marbles. Marbles was always big in Puerto Rico. Yeah. Right? I, remember, I learned how to play marbles in Puerto Rico. There was another game. I don't know what it's called. But you take like a rock. Tied on a string, it's like a poor game. And you dig a hole, and you put your rock in the string in the hole. You know what I mean? It's a rock, right? And then you swing your string to bang their rock. Was it a rock or a bottle cap? Oh, that was fun. And the whole purpose was to bang the other person's whatever it was out of the hole. That was it. So marbles, I learned marbles in Puerto Rico. That's where I learned it. So I heard about a young kid. He had his favorite blue marble. Whenever he would play with people, he would win them. He had a blue marble with a crack in it. He loved that marble. He would put his hand in his pocket, and he, always, he knew which one it was. That was his favorite. He would feel the crack. Oh, there you are. That was his. And one day he was walking down the street, but he loved chocolate more than marbles. And there was a little girl with a box of chocolate. And he thought, man, I would like to have some chocolate. So he told the little girl, let's make a deal. I'll give you all of my marbles if you give me all of your chocolate. She thought, okay, that's a good deal. But what he did is put his hand in his pocket, and he felt for the cracked one. Then he stuck that one further down in his pocket, and he gave her all of them except the cracked blue marble that he loved. And she gave him the chocolate. 
He was so happy eating the chocolate. And as he walked away, he's like walking away eating the chocolate. He thought for a minute, he said, oh, wait. Did you give me all the chocolate? And then she said, you never know. You'll never know. We want God's blessing. We want God to answer prayer. We want God to move and intervene in our lives. But we keep that one marble. There's that one thing we all have. It. I know I'm speaking to somebody here this morning. That you just will not give to the Lord. And I'm telling you, that's the very thing that he wants. If you're going to see the blessings of God in your life, listen, study it. Trust it. Maybe put it this way. Study him. Trust him. Submit to him. Don't keep back that marble. We all got something. Including me. And of course we know Jesus spoke the scriptures. And when he spoke it, it was with power. No? They said he spoke not like other people spoke. He was different. Why? Because he was obedient. He trusted it. He studied it. That's why there was power. When the devil came and he quoted the scripture, for that moment, the devil had to flee. When the rabbis came and began to try to twist them up, he quoted the scriptures. No. The words of Jesus, I don't care who you are. When you read the Gospels, those words of Christ, is something about them, my God, that touches you. Jesus spoke the scriptures, and they had power because he was obedient to it. He trusted it. He loved God. He wanted to know. He already knew the Father, of course, but in that area, and more an example for us, no? I'm going to finish with this. I heard about some White Cliff missionaries, and when I was off in Bible college, I got to meet all these missionaries from all around the world, and I heard about these White Cliff missionaries. They're called White Cliff missionaries, and they went to Papua New Guinea. And when they went to Papua New Guinea, Guinea to, to the tribal people, they began to translate the Bible. From the very beginning, and this is what happened to them. As they were translating the Bible, in that very beginning when it said that, that Eve was created from the ribs of man, they had a culture that oppressed women, these tribal people. And this is what they say, the missionaries happened. Nobody preached it to them, nobody told them, nobody taught it to them as a doctrine but when they heard the word of God said that Eve was created in the image of man and she was a co-equal, they said the tribes change. And they began to treat women with respect. And they began to treat women as equals. The word of God is powerful, my brothers and sisters. You want to walk like Christ walked? You got to get in this word. You got to get in it daily. Don't feel bad. But today, don't throw your Bible in the back seat and pick it up next Sunday. Amen. Carry that thing with you. Amen. Have it on the side of your bed. This time in the middle of the night, I crack open my Bible and I just start reading the word. Amen. You want to walk like Christ? You got to be in the word. Can I get an amen? I hope you're encouraged. Amen. Next Sunday, we're going to meet. Well, Wednesday, they meet here, 11 to 12. They got a 12-step group that meets here. And then Friday, twice. Friday, 11 to 12, a 12-step, and then 6.30, a 12-step. And they're telling me, I told you, they're going to do an NA group soon. I don't know when, but they're going to do it soon. Um, I'll let you know. But Sunday now, I'm calling it the first 15. For 15 minutes, Sunday morning, we'll get together. We're going to be in the back there, and we're going to pray. And today, we started. Amen? So if you're able to come... Please come so we can pray together. Be encouraged. The Lord loves you. Amen. You're his child. He loves you enough that he left you a book, a love letter. Can I get an amen? And he wants you to read it. Amen. And he wants you to grow and become more like Christ. Let me pray for you. Father God, I thank you so much for this time. I pray a blessing on those who are here.
pray for those who are not able to make it, dear God. I know a few are out and got hurt and stuff, and I just lift them up to you, dear God, and I pray healing upon their bodies quick and fast. And I pray, God, as we leave here today, help us to be encouraged, dear God, to know you're for us, not against us. Jesus, in your name we say, amen. I want to collect the tithes and offerings.